All right, all right, all right. Hey, good evening. My name is Justin. I get the honor of being the student director here. I'm so glad y'all are here. Um, I think y'all are more excited about my pants than I am. Skinny Jerry! Literally brought them out because I met with two of y'all this week and they were like, we want the skinny jeans first. So, um, we are in week three of our study through Philippians. So if you have, thank you, those long pauses for sipping. Listen, voice gets dry and then I start slipping on words. And, um, if you've missed the last two weeks, oh boy. Uh, I recommend going back to the YouTube and watching those. We have covered literally verse by verse, line by line, the first two chapters of Philippians. I know it's been a lot. I'm really proud of y'all for hanging in there each and every week and going through it. The goal is if you just take away one thing. That's it. That's why there's a reading plan for you to go back through and to start breaking down scripture for yourself. That's why we record these. So you can go back and go, I think I heard him say something, and I need to go back and check that out. And so tonight, I mean, just, just find one thing to grab onto that you're like, this, I can walk this out. I do have to make a slight apology because I'm human and imperfect. And so last week I was talking to you about how Jesus experienced the same emotions and stuff that we did. And he did. But I mentioned that his mama rejected him. And a few of y'all come with me afterward and you're like, his mom rejected him? Like, what? And at first I was like, yeah, yeah, there's this passage. And I felt super confident. And then I was like, I no longer feel as confident about that as I initially did. So I went back and did, did my research. His mama did not, all right? His mama was faithful, which thank goodness, I mean, you know, virgin birth, and immaculate conception, and it's the son of God. Like, I don't know how you get on your child like that. However, what I was trying to get at is in John 7, 5, you see Jesus is preaching in his hometown, and his brothers come at him, and they say, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. So his family did, in fact, reject him, which granted, if your brother showed up and was like, hey, I can walk on water, and I'm the son of God, also God, you'd be like, bruh, you got three heads, you've been hanging out with Peter too long, like, chill out, right? Um, but what's funny is, after the resurrection, two of his brothers are like, oh, we were very wrong, and they end up writing two books of the Bible, and they're pastors in the church, but that's what I meant to say, so I apologize for Jesus' mama comment that threw a few y'all for a loop. Um, and I want to make sure that I own that because I believe in being honest and I want to make sure I preach the whole council accurately. So as we jump into chapter three tonight, <clears throat> I need to give you some preface. So uh, there's a few things that are going to happen that if you're reading without any context whatsoever, you're going to be so thrown for a loop. First, you have to understand that this is a, this is a letter that we have from Paul and he's going to end up replying in this letter in this chapter specifically, to letters previously written that we don't have. Like the Philippians asked him questions. If you remember our boy Epaphrodite, I really hope I said that right. Epaphroditus, something like that. Anyway, go back and read Philippians 2. And remember, he's the messenger going between, so he brought questions. Paul is going to begin addressing some of these questions and concerns. Primarily, he's going to address some false teaching. You see, the Philippians are a Gentile or non-Jewish followers of Jesus and church. And what happened is all the people, all, primarily all these um, Jews that lived in the area who were very dedicated to their Judea, Judaism. Yep, thank you. Um, and, their, and the Hebrew and the Hebrew God of the Old Covenant are hearing about these radical conversions and they're worshiping the same God, but one sect is saying, hey, we're worshiping Jesus and he died on a cross. Or as again, this other group is like, but there's all this stuff in the law that you're not doing. And Paul's going to address some of those points in the law where he's like, y'all making it too hard for these people. Like, it's all about Jesus, not your law, okay? Jesus fulfilled that. So he's going to talk about some stuff. Middle school boys, where you at? Y'all ready to giggle for half a second? Or can I expect some maturity from you? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Listen, if you, if you came to church your entire life and you're like, this is the book of fairy tales, fam, there is so much stuff in here that you would not put in the kids' book, okay? This is a real book. It is an active book. It is full of real testaments, and they're going to use words that are going to make us giggle from time to time because we live 2,000 years removed. All right. The word that Paul is going to address and he's going to use is the word circumcision. There it is. My high school guys lost it. The context for which it's being used in is simply a physical representation 
of being set apart towards God, primarily underneath the old covenant, which is the old law. Jesus came, fulfilled the law, and then he established a new covenant, which we primarily see as the great commandment, the first and second. Love God, love others. You can do those two things, you're following Jesus' covenants. Very easy. In that old covenant was the circumcision piece. That has been done away with. What was happening in this church is you have this group of people who are so uber religious of the old covenant, they're telling new believers, hey, that's great that you love Jesus. However, you're not doing it right because you're not following these pieces of the old law. Paul's about to get real savage real fast, all right? Y'all ready? Let's jump in. All right, chapter three, verse one. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Can we rejoice in the Lord this morning, this evening? Can we rejoice? Yeah. Not rejoice like it's going to be Yeah! That's rejoicing! All right. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. So he's like, hey, I don't mind talking, I don't mind saying the same thing over and over again, because the more I repeat myself, the more I know that you are being protected. Which then lends us to a question. What is he trying to protect the Philippians from? Verse 2. Watch out for those dogs. Not literal. Like, he's not talking like, woof, woof kind of dogs, all right? Maybe he was a cat lover. I don't know, right? Those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. All right. <clears throat> I had to go really deep this week. Like, I, I read a lot of commentaries. I got really into it. So, dogs here, you see, in, in Jewish tradition, pre-Jesus, the Old Covenant, you had God's chosen people who are the Israelites. The way they viewed everybody else who was Gentile was as dogs. And so what Paul is doing is he's flipping the word and he says, actually the dogs here are the Jewish people holding so tightly to their religion that they've missed Jesus. In fact, it's even kind of calling back to a prophecy found in Isaiah 56, where he says, Israel's watchmen are blind. They lack knowledge. They are all mute dogs. Now, Israel's watchmen would have been like the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all the religious leaders. They cannot bark. They lie around and dream. They love to sleep. They are dogs with mighty appetites. They never have enough. They are shepherds who lack understanding. They all turn to their own way. They seek their own gain. And so Paul's like, watch out for those dogs, the religious dogs who are all about themselves and the law because it makes them feel good. The second is evildoers. So that's just some similar language he uses in some other books, essentially false teachers. That's what he's jumping at. He says, hey, false teachers. And then third, mutilators of the flesh. Once again, he's spinning. So remember, in the old law was circumcision, physical act. If you've got questions, ask your small group leaders, and then I can't wait to hear about it. Um, what he does is because he goes, hey, because Jesus fulfilled the old law, you no longer have to do that. Now, you evildoers, you dogs, you relig super religious people that are trying to attack this church, you have actually begun to break your own law because in Leviticus it says not to harm yourself. And yet there you are creating all kinds of marks and stuff. And so he's like, ha ha, busted by your own law. And so for us today, this is kind of a warning for us to be mindful of those who push religion and not relationship with Jesus. Verse 3, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. So what he's saying is he says, hey, those of us who are truly set apart towards God, it is we who follow Jesus. That's what sets us apart. He's just using that word metaphorically as a symbol. And then he gives three descriptors. He says, listen, if you are part of this, if you're following Jesus, here's three things that we should be able to see in your life. You're serving God, and it says by his spirit. So the Holy Spirit is helping guide you in the way you serve God. Number two is boasting in Christ. Are you boasting about Jesus? Are you talking about Jesus? Are you sharing the gospel with your friends? Listen, he provides a hope that nothing else provides. You can hope for an Xbox for Christmas. I know I am. But I got no assurance of that hope. But in Jesus, I have a hope that is in heaven, and it's assured. Like I know for a fact. That's what Jesus provides. So we boast about that. We shouldn't be hiding it to ourselves. And then finally, no confidence in the flesh. It's not like literal, like, flesh. All right? That's just one of the descriptor words for, like, 
our personal beings. And he says, hey, you have no confidence in you for your salvation or for your righteousness. It doesn't come from you. And then he's going to say, because if there was anybody who could be confident, it's me. At the back end of verses 3 through 4, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons but confidence in the flesh, I have more. And now he's going to give us his rap sheet on just how righteous by man standards he is. He goes, verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, so God's chosen people, of the tribe of Benjamin, let's be real, they're like the favorite child in the people of Israel, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, so the Old Testament law, he goes, a Pharisee, which means I learned it all. I was a priest. I can perform the sacraments. I can teach it to you. It's all memorized. As for zeal, so like a, a fervor, a passion, persecuting the church. These people were so focused in their law, which ironically was painting a picture of how broken we are in need of a Savior, and then prophesied the Savior that they missed the Savior. Like Jesus came and they, they missed it. And what happened then is because they were still so focused on waiting for a savior to rescue them from Rome and not from their own sins and brokenness, they hung them up on a tree and then began persecuting the church. And Paul was one of the ones to go and persecute this church. He was killing Christians. As for righteousness based on the law, and righteousness means to be found morally right or justifiable. And so he used the law as his standard. He goes, all 613, I go 614. Faultless. He said, there ain't nobody that was as good as me by these standards. But, but, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. In his culture, all of that stuff he just listed gets him the highest influence, gets him the most stuff, gets him wealthy, gives him status. But because of Jesus, he tosses it to the side. He says, these things are but loss. Your status and stuff means nothing when it comes to knowing Jesus. I don't care what you wear, I don't care what your influence you think you have is, how many followers, or even if you think you are a good person, and you might be, but by whose standards? Because all that stuff is just temporary, it's earthly, it's going to go away, and ultimately it's worth losing for the sake of having Christ. That's what Paul's saying. Then he keeps going. Verse 8, what is more? I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Remember, he's in prison writing this, so he really has lost a lot. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, so not having a moral rightness of his own that comes from the law, that comes from completing a checklist or good works or deeds, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Sometimes you have to lose to gain. He sacrifices his stuff, he dies to himself, right? Jesus tells us to pick up our crosses and to follow him. What does that imagery mean? We have to die to ourselves so that we can have life in Jesus. What's more, I'm going to teach you guys a Greek word. You ready? Repeat after me. Skubalon. Skubalon. And if you're Greek and I butchered that, I'm sorry. Please teach me after service, okay? So, <clears throat> that word garbage that you just read in the NIV is probably better translated in English as dumb. And in fact, some translations use the word dumb. Now, in the Greek, there are a few different uh, imitations of this. There's one word that uses kind of like garbage, trash. The problem is that some people find other people's trash valuable. Paul wants to make sure you know that the knowledge of knowing Jesus is worth so much more than everything, that he's going to use the extreme version of this word. So to put it frankly, some of you, if you were to use this word at school, would say something is bold, scubulon. You can figure out the rest of that from there. But essentially, all his gains are poop. They're crap. They're worthless. So worthless, you're not going to go digging through it like you would somebody else's garbage or trash. 
because in juxtaposition or in contrast, that's how much more worth it knowing Jesus is. That's the price of knowing. He says, that thing is so much better than all my status, all my wealth, all my influence, all my followers. He says, uh, Jesus is worth it all more. That is literally you. Okay? So where do you merit then your righteousness? What are you accrediting your goodness to? Is it coming from God? Or is it coming from your good works? Do you merit your righteousness from a good God or good works? Chapter 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. The word know here, I'm going to teach you another Greek word, all right? You ready? Genosko. Genosko. This is not a general knowledge. This is not a, I happen to know about chemistry and there's like, chemicals and stuff, you know, goes together and, you know, it's not like that. It, it's more like the way that J.D. and Israel know each other. The, the, way, the way Nathan and Nico know each other. All right? It's, it's, the, it's the way that, like, I know my wife. It's, it's an experiential knowledge. It's a, I am walking with this person and hearing about their lives and doing things with them. It's some of the ways your small group leaders have begun to know you by going to your football games and by hanging out with you in that small group room and you getting real honest because it's a safe place and going, dude, I've got stuff. They don't just know about you. They don't just know that you're, okay, male, five foot two, hasn't hit puberty yet, you know? No, they know, man, this guy's got questions. And here's what he's doing with his, you know, here's the struggle with his parents. Paul says, I want to know Jesus that way. He says, I want to know Jesus in a deeply intimate and experiential way. Not just know about him, but know him. And because of knowing him, that helps lead to knowing the resurrection, to hope. It means if I know him in this way and share in the salvation that he provides, I then get to share in the resurrection. I get to be in heaven with him someday. That's what Paul's saying here. So do we want to genosco Christ? Do we want to really know him? Or do we just want to know about him? Right, just kind of add him to your life. Just, well, another thing that I have to know stuff about. 3.12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. So he's not writing and saying that he's already obtained perfection or resurrection. He just says, hey, every day I'm pushing a little bit closer to being more and more like Jesus, so to knowing more and more stuff on a personal level about Jesus. He submitted. When it says Christ took hold of him, it means he says, I laid it down. I submitted to Jesus. I said, wherever you want to take me, Lord. And he took Paul all over the place. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, he's going to give a practical. He says, hey, if you're going to run like I'm running, if you're going to pursue Jesus like I'm pursuing Jesus, here's a practical help. He says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So there's a reminder again, he's not perfect. And then the practical piece is he goes, forget your past. If you're in Jesus, it's been washed away. Because Jesus said for you what you could not do for yourself. And so all your shame, all your sin, all your failures, all your moments of deep embarrassment were nailed to that cross and buried in hell. And Christ rose again to provide freedom for you. And Paul says, so forget about it. Why are you stuck thinking about that when we have the hope that is heavenward? The hope that is heaven ahead of us. I know it's easier said than done. But man, it goes a lot easier when we forget about things instead of being stuck and start pushing towards heaven. It makes it a lot easier to live like this. Sometimes life goes sideways and you can get really mad about it. And really upset, and if I'd just been there two minutes earlier, if I had done this thing or that thing, we just go, it happens. And someday I'll be in heaven, and what happened here really won't matter that much, because I'll be with my Jesus. 
All of us then, verse 15, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So he's like, hey, if you're, if you're a mature believer, that means you're thinking about heaven. You're thinking on the things of heaven, on the kingdom of God. So you're not letting as much earthly stuff bother you. And he goes, then if you've got a different thought about this, we'll just keep praying that God reveals his will for you to you. Where are your eyes focused? Are you focused on heaven or are you focused on right here? Stuff other people are doing or things that you think you need. Verse 17, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Follow those who follow Jesus. Model those who model Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul tells the Corinthian church, he goes, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Follow those who follow Jesus. All right? And if, so the, the pastors you follow online, the leaders, me, your small group leaders, if they're following Jesus, follow them. Model them. They're good examples. And if you have questions and you're like, I don't know if they really are or not, check them against this. This is the word of God. This tells us about Jesus. So if you're following a leader and they say something, you're like, something, man, something in my spirit seems kind of off about it. Double check it. Double check it. I heard this at a conference once. The guy speaking, he said, listen, if you interpret something and you're the only one who interpreted it that way, you're probably wrong. So if you're the only person saying something and you can't say, hmm, four other people have said the same thing and have used the same references, that person might be wrong. It might not be someone worth following in this season. Now, we have to ask, okay, Paul, why should we follow? What's the purpose in calling us to follow those who follow Jesus? So 3.18 says, <clears throat> For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears. So Paul is moved to emotions. He's hurt by the people that he's about to write about. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. There are people who live opposed to the gospel. They're enemies of the cross. They're enemies of hope. And it breaks Paul's heart because he knows they're living hopeless. They're clinging to their good stuff, to their morals, perhaps to their religion, to their good deeds as a hope. And unfortunately, it's a fleeting hope. There's no guarantee or surety there. Because then you have to ask the question, well, how good is good enough? And he says, there are some people out there that live opposed to this. So not only do they not believe it, but they are actively against it. He's going to spell them out. 319. Their destiny is destruction. I didn't write this, okay? I'm just the messenger. If y'all got issues, you can take it up with him. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So he's actually relating it all the way back to verse 2 where he laid out the dogs, the evildoers, and the mutilators of the flesh. So he says, hey, their stomachs, he's calling that out to the dietary law that these people were living by. They're like, you can't eat that. You shouldn't eat that. Even though God had revealed to Peter, he's like, bro, eat the bacon. Like, it's better that way, all right? Eat the bacon. You want your steak, you eat your steak medium rare? Welcome to the new covenant. That's right. I love it. Their glory is in their shame. That's once again a callback to circumcision, where they're parading around a thing that no longer matters, and now it's a little more shameful. But they're, they're glorifying it because they're like, but I'm following the law. A law that doesn't matter underneath Jesus' law, because he fulfilled it and then established a new covenant. And their mind is set on earthly things. They're just constantly thinking about themselves and their stuff and their influence. And if we all take a beat and take a moment, it reminds us of people that we know, possibly even ourselves. Where's your mind at? You want to tell the difference between those who are in religion from those who are in relationship with Jesus? Check their focus. What are they talking about? What are they looking at? What are they telling you? Where are they focused? Are they focused here and now, and you should do this and don't do that? Or are they focused on, man, there is a hope that is in heaven, and Jesus came for you and for me? Last two verses here, and Mackenzie and um, Reed are going to go ahead and come back up. But our citizenship is in heaven, 
And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. He says, hey, if you believe in Jesus, you have a citizenship, and guess what? It's not earth. It's not temporary. It is a permanent, everlasting citizenship in heaven you were just passing through. He says, and furthermore, you have this hope that is there. And for some of us in the room, we got like weak lungs. Maybe you got, you know, some blemishes. You're like, my mental health. He says, hey, when you get to heaven, the same power that Jesus has, where everything, remember the whole verse, chapter two, every knee will bow and tongue confess, that sovereignty piece of Jesus. He says, that's going to make our bodies perfect and match his glorious body. Some of you, that's just the hope you need is you're like, wait, there's a place I can go to be perfect? Yeah, but the only ticket is to Jesus. That's the only way to get there. So here's the bottom line from tonight. You can focus on Jesus or you can focus on you. You can focus on Jesus or you can focus on you. These religious people did it in the name of God, but really they're just focusing on themselves because by applying the law to other people, it made them feel better. Have you ever looked at somebody else and gone, well, I'm better than them because I don't, you know, I, don't, I don't cuss in math class. Like, oh. Really, you're just focused on you, just making you feel better. Or you can focus on Jesus. And then here's three things if you want to write these down as reminders. Status and stuff mean nothing when compared to knowing Jesus. I'm not saying you got to live in poverty gospel. I'm not saying you got to give it all up. I'm just saying at the end of the day, it's not, it's not leaving earth with you. But knowing Jesus is worth it infinitely more. Number two, righteousness comes through comes from God through faith, not you through good works. Righteousness comes from God through faith, not you through good works. And then number three, where are your eyes focused? Are you get caught up often here, or are you looking ahead to the glory that is to come? We're going to sing this final song. I'm actually going to ask you to stay sitting during this song. The front will still stay open for response. So if you want to come up here and kneel and pray, you are more than welcome. But for the rest of us, I think we just need to take this time to sit and sing these words and really just worship these words and pray them and praise them to God. And then if you're in here and you, you're just trying to live a good life, and you're like, my goodness will get me to heaven. Surely I'm going to heaven. Fam, that is righteousness through the law, not righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus. Tonight, please don't leave here without talking to an adult about how you can have his righteousness imputed onto you because he did for you what you cannot do for yourself. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for Paul. Thank you that you gave him a boldness like no one else that I know of that he was willing to share the gospel even from a prison cell. God, I, I just pray that these students tonight would have found one thing that they would take away and that whether it's conviction, which is not the same as condemnation, conviction is to help push us closer to you, that they would lean into that. Because that means you're calling their name. Whether it's a, it's a call to accept Jesus' righteousness, that they would not be ashamed because it's nothing to be ashamed of you're a good father and you're granting a good gift and all I have to do is accept it that they would walk into that God I pray for the rest of us in here who are, we've been following Jesus and sometimes it's just easy to see the shiny thing around us and chase it that tonight we remember that our hope is in heaven and even though things happen that are hard or not easily to understand that sometimes it's just life and that you are good and that there is a hope beyond us that we would then begin to live out of that place of hope. So just name I pray.